Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar and panel discussion titled New Guidelines and Modern Chromatographic Solutions Converge to Ensure Data Quality in the Pharmaceutical Laboratory. In today's session, Heather Longden, Senior Marketing Manager of Pharmaceutical Intelligence at Waters Corporation, will present on the benefits of improved technology with robust fit-for-purpose methods using the new ARC HPLC system. Dr. Horatio Pepper, Director of General Chapters at the United States Pharmacopeia, will present updates on new regulatory guidelines. And finally, the session will culminate with an expert panel discussion led by Isabel Vitru. Pharmaceutical Market Development Manager at Waters Corporation. Isabel will be joined by Dr. Horatio Papa and Heather Longden, as well as Dr. Philip Foreman, Senior Fellow and Product Quality Director at GSK, and James Pound, Secretary and Scientific Director of the British Pharmacopeia Commission and Group Manager of the British Pharmacopeia and Laboratory Services at the Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency. The panel will discuss strategies for managing analytical procedures and technology improvements in the pharmaceutical laboratory within the context of new regulatory guidelines. If you have any questions for our speakers on our panel, please feel free to submit them at any time during the webinar, and you can do this by clicking on the purple tab to the left of your screen. You'll also find related materials, including a downloadable certificate of attendance in the related resources tab. So without further delay, I'd like to hand over to our speakers for today's presentation and panel discussion, and I'd like to thank them all for participating today. Please go ahead. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, today I'm going to give a quick summary of an earlier webinar that uh, I gave on behalf of Waters, just to introduce the topic. And during that seminar, we did raise some questions, and hopefully today we're going to answer some of those questions for our audience. When I talk about data integrity, I do like to use this slide to talk about the people, the laboratory systems, the IT components, and the quality separations. Um, but today, what we're really going to talk about much more is around the quality separations aspect of it. So while people generally think on data integrity about the people and the training and the computerized systems, as well as the IT backup uh, solutions, the quality separation really has a big part to play in the, in the data quality and data integrity um, arena as well and, and helps to assure that data quality. If we look at a few of the regulatory observations, and these all came from the month of April, uh, as well as a couple of other ones, we can see that a lot of regulators are looking at the manipulation of data or changing integration parameters in chromatographic separations as potentially being excessive manipulation of the results. And when we look to see what the root cause of why the analyst is doing that, changing the integration parameters or relabeling peaks, we can see that the root cause is often down to previously resolved peaks, which are now no longer resolved. Another example here where it was noted that an analyst was manually integrated in the test, and they noted the fact that the chromatogram lacked peak resolution as well as there being no approved protocol for manual integration or quality oversight. And a final observation really was specifically called out co peaks during impurity testing, which resulted in the analysis failing to detect an out of spec result for at least one drug product. Multiple examples of the failure to properly integrate those co-saluting peaks were observed. Um, and really this comes down to, you could say that this is inadequate in integration of the peaks, but really it's demonstrating an inadequate analytical method, which may result in adulterated products being released to the market. So this idea of the analysts having to intervene because of the peaks that are not properly resolved is causing concerns around data integrity. And when we look at that root cause of why we have these data integrity concerns, specifically in chromatography, because the analyst is intervening to try to optimize those integration parameters, it's kind of part and parcel of the same problem of method modernization. Because if the method was improved so that they were not closely eluding peaks, then the analyst would be able to get automatic integration right first time, and we wouldn't have concerns about whether they were doing that integration and manipulation of those results correctly. So let's have a quick look at a summary of what we talked in the last seminar about, about improving performance. What other things can we do to improve reproducibility, reliability, accuracy, and precision? 
And this is really around the concept of the new ARC HVLC that Waters released recently, which is taking a lot of the robustness aspects of our Alliance HVLCs and bringing some of the performance aspects of the Acuity ARC into a general purpose but very robust ARC HVLC, which offers some alternatives for being able to modernize methods to make them faster and have better resolution. And just, I wanted to take a few moments to show some examples of that. When we did the last webinar, we did a, a poll and our audience was very helpful and talked to us about what the primary drivers for replacing LC instruments. And while number one and number three talked about we would like to replace our HBLCs when we can get better performance, we can modernize, we can maximize efficiency, or we can make sure that we have and we pass our system stability criteria, there's a whole uh, organization of people who really hang on to those LC systems for as long as they can, probably for financial reasons, unless the vendor stops supporting them. So Waters have put together a program to try and help those people be able to trade in and flex up their instruments and modernize them to allow them to, to, to see the maximum efficiency and the superior system suitability um, in an easier and simpler way. So if anybody's interested, do contact your Waters organization about this, this program, which should enable you to be able to have access to these modern systems. We talked in the last webinar about the most important thing when you're bringing a new technology into, into the laboratory. And that, and that is that I can take existing methods and I can transfer them, whether they've been developed on a, on a traditional HPLC, like an alliance system, or whether they're coming from a UHPLC system like the Acuity Arc, being able to transfer those methods across and get exactly the same chromatography on those new systems. And our scientists have been busy working on that. Um, and we showed some data here where we took a reasonably challenging method um, and run that same method with exactly the same column and exactly the same conditions on those different instruments. We can see the same chromatography looks the same. We can see that the, the resolution is the same between that critical pair of peaks five and six in the middle. Um, and we can see the retention times are the same or all in the same kind of ballpark. And that, that's really the, the key thing that we want to do for method transfer kind of exercise. But what we also focused on in that last webinar was looking at improving the methods and whether that's with a faster separation using method scaling to be moved from a five micron particle to a three and a half micron particle. And we can scale the method and speed it up by having a shorter column and by speeding up the flow rates in order to get a faster analysis. So chromatographers can take advantage of these modern HPLCs that can run at a higher, much higher back pressure to run faster analyses without having to redevelop the method. And we can use that theory about LODP and the, and the allowable changes in chapter 621 of the USP to get the same separation, but faster, as long as we scale the method. And that normally includes running a higher flow rate, as I said before, on a shorter column. But there is some advantage as well in taking that, that momentum of being able to modernize a method and maybe not scaling every aspect of that method. And that should can give us some real method reproducibility and resolution improvements. As you can see in this slide, um, if I want to look at that critical pair in the middle of that chromatogram at about 6.2 minutes, if I reduce the particle size but I keep the column length the same, so I don't scale the column length, and I also don't scale the flow rate, um, then all I can get is a, is a very similar looking chromatogram, um, but what I've got is much higher performance of that method. The resolution of that critical pair, remember the thing that the regulators are looking at about the analyst doing manipulation into, the, into those um, in, into that peak integration, I should be able to, with a better, almost double resolution value for that pair, allow the software to do the integration of that much more automatically, right first time, without the need of the analyst to optimize the parameters. And what we also get, because we've sharpened the peaks using that smaller particle size, we also get an increase in response, and we get the peak heights are higher on that, on that narrower column. 
So instead of using the scaling to get a faster analysis, what we've done here is we've scaled, used a different particle size in order to get a much better, more performant method. However, because this method is a gradient method and because I've not done the scaling, this would be, according to the USB 621, would need to be a revalidated method because we don't have allowable changes like this currently on the gradient analysis, only when we're doing isocratic analyses. We really want to improve all of those things that we've just seen because um, to improve our analytical methods and whether that's sensitivity because we want to get to lower levels and we saw in the example how we could improve the sensitivity. We want robustness so that the injections are predictable and the minimal analyst intervention in, in order to get the peak integration done correctly and it should also reduce out of spec or abnormal results and the investigations you have to do because of the method issues. We can also look at how we do methods and maybe combining assays and impurity assays um, into a single method speeds up the amount of or reduces the number of runs that somebody has to do in the laboratory. We can use orthogonal techniques like UV or MS to offer more information specifically about unknown peaks to be able to identify what they are. And if we can do more automation, then there's less check-in even in the result calculation area for the reviewer who's looking at those, looking at that data. Waters think that in the laboratory, we should have the courage to improve our methods. However, redeveloping analytical methods has been seen to be a very risky activity. And once a method is, is validated and registered, people are very loath to change them. What, but what can we, things like, what can I change an analytical test in the middle of a stability result? What do I need to do there? Or what if a new method shows an impurity we didn't do before? Do I have to go back and test earlier lots that I've released with a new method? But one of the bigger concerns is because we registered that analytical method, regulators with many different regulators around the world, what aspects do I need to take care of if I want to change it? Do we need to validate this new method? And do I need to re-register or update licenses with all the regulatory agencies? And these are questions we posed in our last webinar. So we're hoping today to get through um, and ask our experts on the panel about how the recent and imminent regulatory guidances make improving the analytical procedures uh, easier to accomplish. Uh, we mentioned in that last webinar that there is work being done on regulations, but as well as the ICHQ2 method validation uh, guidance came out in 1995, was followed with an FDA guidance on that same topic. And in December of last year, ICHQ12 was released, which has a couple of annexes specifically dealing with post-approval changes for analytical methods, either by established conditions or with a, a, a structured enhanced approach to method development. And very recently, USP Chapter 1220 has been released, very timely, so we thank the USP for that. Um, and that's really incorporating this concept of analytical procedure life cycle in line with what you find in Q12. Coming up later, we, we will have a new ICH guidance Q14, probably at the end of next year, which will also embrace those concepts. And there will be a follow-up of our ICH Q2 re, uh, revision late in 2020, looking at method validation, not specifically addressing post-approval changes, but talking about enhanced validation and validation of modern technologies. So those are the guidances we wanted to spend some time today talking with to our experts and having them help us to understand how this is going to help us improve analytical methods. And that's where I now hand over to Horacio Papa. We're very pleased to have him here to share his thoughts on these regulatory updates. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, the um, I would like to present to you uh, the the recent uh, development of USP in 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 the the field of the analytical procedure life cycle, and is a chapter twelve twenty uh, that is is being presented in the pharmacopoeia forum right now. So we expect to receive comments between September and November. And um, and have our expert discuss in the comments and and move to the next step. 
So let me start with the definition of you of uh, validation USP. Uh, the de this definition taken from chapter 1225, validation of compendial procedure, says that validation of an analytical procedure is the process by, by which it is established by laboratory studies that the performance characteristics of a procedure meets the requirement for the intended analytical application. And, and I underline the, the last phrase because I think it's, it's the very important uh, part of the definition and is probably one of the reasons that trigger all uh, the development around the uh, analytical procedure life cycle. And is the fact that when you uh, repeat or reproduce in your laboratory all the experiments that are dictated by 1225 or, or ICHU2, there's a still not a clear um, understanding on how the method uh, works and you may not be able to identify if the method is suitable for the intended use. So there are a couple of uh, several chapters in USP that talks about validation and other um, uh, activities related to the life cycle of the method. And those are the 1225 for validation, 1226 for verification, 1224. Uh, for transfer and the, the new uh, chapter in the family, 1210, for statistical tools of procedure validation. Um, all these activities, validation, verification, and transfer, are um, operate under the same, uh, the same rationale. Uh, this is the table that is uh, in, in, in 1225. It is also a very similar table in um, in Q2, and the idea is to uh, categorize the method in three or, or four categories and indicate what are the experiments you have to uh, repeat in, in each case, depending on the category of the method. More or less, you follow the same approach for, uh, especially for verification. The difference is that when you do a validation, you're trying to challenge the method. When you do a verification, you're trying to challenge how the method works with your sample and in your laboratory. But the again, the idea is to select what are the activities you need to do. Um, so, so again, after doing all these experiments, probably you, you don't have a, a, a good picture about if the method is suitable for the intended use um, regarding the quality of the analytical data that the method generates. Um, there are certain precedents. If um, if you look at the um, a document from FDA in 2004, they start recognizing that the uh, variability and the uncertainty of the measurement uh, may be a, um, a very significant um, reason of obtaining out of specification results. Uh, measurement system variability can be significantly part of the total variability. Uh, they say similar and repeating out of specification observations for different products across the industry and uh, less than optimal understanding of variability. So they, they made clear that the, uh, there was, uh, there was a, um, an, not a good knowledge about the performance of the method by performing validation as we know at this point. Uh, the, it is also recognized that in many cases you will reproduce the ICH uh, Q2 or 1225 as a checkbox um, um, way, uh, trying to, um, to fulfill uh, regulatory requirements rather than again, knowing and understanding how the method works. So the the and and based on all these uh, um, ideas, we created a panel. USP created a panel. It was the first one, a validation and verification expert panel. Uh, it was I think it was around um, 2013, and this panel uh, developed uh, I would say three very important documents that represent in some way. <clears throat> sorry, four documents that represent in some way the uh, foundations of the uh, what it was later, uh, 1220. The first one was published in PF 39.5 <clears throat> and represent, um, I would say, um, a philosophical umbrella document that uh, present uh, the, the, um, the more important elements of the life cycle 
um, the life cycle approach. Uh, then the other three uh, go more in depth into, again, the, those individual elements we have uh, in 42.2, uh, fitness for use, decision rules, and target measurement uncertainty. In 42.5, analytical target profile, structure and application through the analytical life cycle. And finally, analytical control strategy in the same PF, 42.5. Those, all these documents are available for, for, for the public. So please feel free to go to Pharmacopoeia Forum and, and, and read them. There was a later uh, another article that present a very preliminary uh, version of 12, uh, 1220 uh, in the form of an uh, article for discussion. That was, was not a formal proposal. The formal proposal is the one that we are presenting today in PF 46 uh, file. So this is the, uh, the scheme of the um, analytical procedure life cycle. Uh, and, and, and start with the very uh, early stages of the method, uh, the need of the method, which is the develop, developing the analytical target profile. This is an element that is probably new into the, uh, the um, evaluation scheme, and I think it's, it's, it's probably one of the more important pieces because is, this is where we define the uh, necessary quality of the reportable value. And the other stage one, stage two, and then stage three, which is the three stages that uh, con continue after the finish of the ATP, have the only purpose to uh, demonstrate in every stage of the life of the method that the results we are obtaining meet the requirements of the analytical procedure life cycle. So briefly, stage one is procedure design. We, uh, we and, and, and probably the, the new part of this is that there is a, a uh, very uh, strong um, uh, requirement of gathering knowledge uh, of the uh, of the um, how the method works. So we need to understand how the method works. We need to understand the effect of all the variables in the method. And finally, we will develop the method, and and we also determine here. Uh, the initial analytical control strategy, and also, if it's needed, the replication strategy. Stage two is basically is the closest uh, to the uh, typical uh, validation uh, uh, step we have today, and um, and it, but basically, will we center in demonstrating that uh, the accuracy and precision of the reportable result is suitable for the intended use within the range that method will be used. Um, all the other components of the validation of the other performance characteristics are already tested during the method uh, design, and uh, but it also can be included here as part of the report. And finally, the stage three, which is probably in many cases new for, uh, for people, is that how we will monitor the performance of the method through the life cycle until the method is retired. So uh, we will put in place um, a control strategy, which is defined during the method development, and um, trying to collect data to confirm that the method is uh, performed. So this, all these three elements will help us to move the, uh, the method uh, uh, during the verification and transfer, et cetera, moving from lab to lab, et cetera, and also we are out, allowed us to continue the improvement of the method. I think it, this is also very, very important, uh, at least as a pharmacopoeia, because pharmacopoeia is also always uh, or usually criticized because uh, they are very static, and in some cases they represent a roadblock for improvement, and we want to change that mindset. And, and, and this is a way that we think that even, even uh, pharmacopoeia procedures can be improved using uh, this approach. So a few words about the analytical target profile. Again, the ATP is a prescriptive description of the desired performance of an analytical procedure that is used to measure quality attributes. Uh, this is the definition. You may encounter many, many different uh, definitions of the ATP. I, I will say that this is a concept that is evolving. Um, being in 1220, it, it will be present in Q14, et cetera. This will help 
to uh, validate uh, one unified definition, but I, you can see what is the idea. The other main element of the ATP is that it is independent of the measurement technology. And is in fact, the ATP is defined before selecting the methodology. And in many cases, you will select the methodology based on the uh, performance needed for the result. What should be included in, in the ATP? Uh, basically, the ATP should contain, uh, as a minimum, what is the definition of the analyte, uh, a brief description of the matrix, uh, the precision and accuracy uh, of the acceptable, uh, reputable result, and eventually the, the range of the, um, of the method. So in which range we will use the method. Um, so again, the, the, the main, uh, one of the main things in the, in the selection, in this um, definition of the ATP is to say, what is the maximum bias and precision we want to have? Uh, we will use bias for accuracy, uh, um, but, uh, but you may know about the discrepancy between uh, ISO and uh, ICH in terms of using the terminology. Um, so we are more familiar to the term accuracy, however, we are using bias as a term in, in 1220. Um, in, in general, in uh, the matrix we usually use in the pharmacopoeia, uh, in the, sorry, in the pharmaceutical industry, bias may not be a concern. Um, and especially if it is a concern, it will be detected in the, in the method development. Um, and that obviously needs to be considered in in if if is uh, if is there, the um, the bias and precision limits for the ATP will be based in many factors, in la, as the criticality of the quality attributes that we are trying to move uh, to measure, the risk of an unacceptable an unacceptable result. Uh, the width of the specification acceptance range is not the same when you have 98102 like an a, uh, API or 9110 in, in a drug product. And the, the potential clinical safety or efficacy impact in the, uh, the result in the range. Um, this is, this uh, scheme is taken from um, the, the, one of the um, um, European guidances. Uh, um, it, that describe the uh, uh, error and uncertainty. And I think that the idea is, to, is it is very clear to demonstrate what is the um, impact in the decision rule and why uh, the uh, defining the ATP in advance may be important. If you look at the scenario one and in scenario four, the distribution of the uh, reportable results is very clear that in one case, they're all outside the specification and in, in, in the case in scenario one and all in the, within the specification in the scenario four. Mm -hmm. It is more difficult to identify um, what happened in, in the scenario two and three where certain part of the uh, distribution of the results are within or outside the specification. And this is where the ATP play a role because this will define how much of the uh, distribution of the error can be accepted to be outside the uh, specification in order to conclude that the product pass. On the other way, how much of the, of the error can be, um, uh, well, again, outside of the uh, specification to determine that the, the, the product didn't pass. So um, with these two um, elements uh, concluded and the ATP defined, we enter into the uh, procedure design, which is the first stage. Um, the, um, and, and again, in this case, we, we collect all the elements, all the knowledge, we do the experiments, we do the risk assessment, we, we check the results based uh, within the, uh, against the ATP. And finally, when we conclude the stage one, um, we should have the method parameters uh, minim uh, that, that allows to meet the ATP. So we will minimize the bias and, the and, and, and get the appropriate precision. We understand the effect of the procedure parameters in the performance of the method. Uh, we we uh, 
optimize the performance characteristics of the analytical procedure, including accuracy, precision, definition of the calibration model, selectivity, sensitivity, et cetera. We define a preliminary uh, scheme for replication strategy, how many samples, how many standards we need to run every time that we run the test. This is probably also new for pharmacopoeias, and, 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 and this, this uh, element will impact heavily in the way pharmacopoeias are written. And finally, the control strategy. What are the things that we need to, uh, the, the data we need to collect through the uh, routine application of the method? Uh, obviously, in addition to the typical um, system suitability requirement, requirements. Uh, in the second stage, as we said before, we enter into the qualification stage. It consists of study designed to demonstrate that the procedure is suitable for the intended use in the laboratory. So this is the first uh, step, um, uh, the last step before implementing the method in the routine lab. Uh, we are confirming that the reportable result meet the ATP criteria. Uh, we uh, confirm that the procedure, the procedure, the other procedure performance characteristics, usually with uh, data generated dur during stage one. And at the end of stage two, the replication strategy is confirmed and it's confirmed that the performance uh, procedure meets the ATP and other criteria. And with those elements, we uh, we go into the stage three. The stage three uh, continuous performance verification has the purpose to uh, to uh, uh, actively uh, uh, and proactively detect any shift in the method that may require some um, uh, more in-depth uh, revision of the uh, character of that. Um, uh, performance characteristics of the method. We know that the methods are not uh, static and uh, with different environment will uh, act differently. So it is important to collect information uh, regarding how the method is performing. Um, and so this is this is a little bit more than the typical uh, system suitability test. Uh, we are also collecting information and put it in control charts and those type of uh, elements used in a uh, statistical process control that can be identified, again, a shift before uh, we have start obtaining results outside the ATP requirements. So with that, I will finish the, um, the uh, description or the discussion on, on 1220, and I will give you a, a couple of um, comments on the, the development of ICAQ2 and Q14. Um, you know, uh, the ICAQ2 and Q14 concept papers are uh, already in the, um, in the ICH website. So you can go there and read it on, in detail. But um, basically, the intention of Q2 is to uh, revise the guidance to, uh, to, to incorporate also um, um, multivariate models, uh, how to validate multivariate models, which is something that was not included in the current guidance, and, and also create uh, the, um, the basic, uh, incorporate the basic elements that can allow people to use uh, the, uh, what ICH called the enhanced approach, which is uh, meta development using analytical QVD, ATP, uh, all the elements we described in 1220. Uh, within the discussion, initially the intention was to create only one guidance. As we move into the discussion, the decision of the of the working group was to uh, uh, create two different guidance, ICHU2, which is basically the validation paper uh, document. And, um, and please, let's move to the next slide. And um, Q14, which is the guidance, um, um, that concerns the uh, meta development. As you can see, the difference between Q2, Q14, and, and 1220 is that 1220 is probably more general in terms of describing the life cycle from the beginning to the end, while Q2 speaks on uh, validation and Q14 speaks on meta, validate, um, meta development. And, um, and so the, the, the guidance are in the process of being developed. I think that the next step will be to have uh, um, a version available for public comments. 
Um, I can give you some um, very preliminary um, comments on the contents. Uh, so basically, uh, one of the things that you will notice again is that Q14 will speaks on uh, ATP, which is a new element that is incorporated in Field 20. Um, and also you will notice some uh, um, changes in, uh, in Q2, uh, for example, robustness and, uh, and system suitability, which is uh, now described in Q2, will be fully described in Q14 as part of the method development, which is uh, more reasonable. Um, and um, so basically those are the main main uh, components that we know at this point that may happen. Finally, I would like to thank uh, the members of the Analytical Procedure Lifecycle uh, Expert Panel in USP. Um, as we know, in the new cycle, we are moving this panel into a new expert committee, which is measurement and data quality. So uh, most of these uh, members will be now part of a new expert committee. Uh, that will uh, try to study all the measurement systems in USB. And with that, um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Horacio and Heather, for these excellent presentations. I would like to invite you now to join our panel discussion. We are honored uh, to have four wonderful subject matter experts on the panel. You already met Heather Longdon from Waters and Horacio Papa from the USP. They are joined by Dr. Phil Borman, Senior Fellow and Director of Product Quality at GSK, who also volunteers his expertise at the USP and BP, and is widely viewed as a QBD guru. And Dr. James Found, a group leader of the British Pharmacopeia and Laboratory Services at the MHRA, and also Editor-in-Chief of the British Pharmacopeia. James, Phil, Horacio, and Heather, welcome. My name is Isabelle Vitrieux, and I will be moderating this panel. So our first question is for Phil. Uh, Phil, you are a subject matter expert on analytical quality by design. Why should we apply QBD principles to the analytical procedure? And what does that mean for patient safety? Okay, th thanks, Isabel. So, um, um, I think there's many reasons to um, apply analytical quality by design. Um, I, I think primarily the main reason is to ensure that we have robust um, analytical controls um, which, which measure critical quality attributes um, to the required uncertainty so we can sentence batches with confidence. Um, which ensures patient safety and efficacy. So I think that's the primary reason. It really um, drives robustness. I think secondary reasons is very much um, from a manufacturer perspective. Um, I think it enables us to gain an understanding about our method performance um, and it enables us to maybe deliver a framework to understand um, alternative ways of measuring CQAs um, so we can maybe switch between different analytical procedures and different analytical technologies in a more agile way. So I'm, I'm hoping um, this new framework is going to enable greater innovation. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, okay, so I, I do have a question for James. James, welcome to our panel. Um, in Horacio's presentation, James, we heard about the work of the USP and the ICA on these enhanced approaches. Uh, could you please tell us about the activities uh, and the current thinking uh, at the MHRA? Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting to see Horacio give an update on where USP are, and I think they've made some great progress. I think if I was to compare and contrast and talk around what we have done, is I think we've taken a very practical case study. So we took a cross-agency group, so this involved license assessors um, uh, from the licensing division of MHRA, uh, inspectors, GMP inspectors from MHRA, folks from our laboratories, and folks from the pharmacopeia. And we took a product, a Torvastatin tablets, and we tried to apply some of these concepts. Think about how it related to methods uh, in the pharmacopeia. So that went through all the different stages, so analogous to how 
Horatio described, that kind of initial bit of procedure design. So looking at the method, looking through the risk, what it was going to be used for, what would be in a potentially appropriate ATP through the other stages where we ran through risk assessments and then using experimental designs to evaluate where the high risk sat for the method um, and then doing some different ATPs. So what we did is for ATPs, uh, Horatio described a nice kind of generic description for them. If you look at the literature, there's, there's a number of different uh, ways people have tried to describe an ATP and we evaluated different ones. So some very traditional Q2 type ATPs, but ones looking at ideas like uh, measurement uncertainty or things looking at concepts such as uh, test uncertainty ratios, to some other concepts that exist already in other areas around how you understand and, and relate the, the methods fitness for purpose to the intended use and a kind of specification for the measurement. So we ended up that project and then we worked with our labs, we collaborated with industry and formed a, a working party. And the outcome of that is we published a, a consultation uh, the latter part of last year and the response went out over this summer about um, what the views are of stakeholders and what we were doing um, and where they saw the value and usage of some of these ideas. So that's on uh, MHRA's webpage on GovUK. And what we'll be doing is then taking that forward through potentially publishing guidance, um, more case studies, looking at different CQAs. So we looked, we looked at the content in the, the, the assay test uh, for atorvastatin tablets. So that's all a solid dose, so quite straightforward. But obviously there are different tests. So there's impurities, there's dissolution, for example, and there are more complex dosage forms. So getting our hands dirty, so to speak, I think was really useful because we came across some issues which I don't think we would have if we hadn't actually got in the lab and, and played with the ideas. Um, so that's what we've been up to over the last uh, few years. And again, you know, there's a bit of cross-pollination. We've had some good connections with Horatio and colleagues and also um, with the likes of Phil, um, where we've worked with industry as well on this project. Uh, thank you very much, James. It's great to see the engagement and collaboration across the different uh, stakeholders. Uh, so, Phil, a question for you. You have a unique position uh, since you have been involved with uh, the, the British Pharmacopoeia as well as the US Pharmacopoeia uh, as a volunteer. Uh, it's interesting to see uh, that the, the VP uh, studied with a case study while the USP uh, focused more on, on concepts. So, I'm interested to hear from you about. Uh, the, I guess the different approaches that the USP and the BP took, um, and and maybe some comments on this. Yeah, th thanks, Isabel. So, um, I, I, I mean, I think her and James have already covered uh, the, the intent of the USP and um, BP activities. For, from my perspective, um, it, it's really been great to see both pharmacopoeias um, drive. Uh, the, the, these new concepts understand um, how they're applied. Um, you, you know, to uh, to add to what they've said, me, the, the USP's intent, and, and and this has been going on for you know probably five plus years. So so it's it's really a culmination of a lot of work. It, is to bring together probably the leading. Uh, scientists in this area um, and provide a forum for those scientists in industry, academia, to really come together uh, as a precursor to the ICH topic um, and really try to define the most logical way of using these concepts, applying them. You know, we've thought of case studies, but we try to bubble that up into a very clear framework all the way from early development in the pharmaceutical industry to um, you know, longer term use of methods on assets which have been on market for 20, 30 years. So, so the intent of the USP was really to cover that end-to-end -end, um, life cycle of, of methods. Um, I think if we look at the BP um, focus and again BP um, has been going the, the, this case study has been going on for a similar amount of time they really looked at a very specific example so they've taken a um, specific monograph um, for a drug product tablet um, and and we've really worked together to um, provide a very rigorous case study in trying some of these concepts um, assess risk assessments experimental design 
but in particular the analytical target profile which is a really exciting new concept and i applaud the uh, bp and the mhra of trying to get their head around this critical concept because that is going to form uh, really the cornerstone of ichq 14. so i really see the usp and bp work as being very complementary uh, and and um yeah i'm really excited um about this work because of the precursor to what's coming with ichq 14. wonderful thank you very much phil um so you touched, you touched upon uh, applying uh, those concepts to new analytical procedures uh, and also exist, existing um, analytical procedures. So maybe this is a question for Horacio, if Horacio would like to uh, activate his camera. Uh, so the concepts that were described uh, by the USP and the BP, can they be applied to both new analytical procedures as well as existing approved analytical procedures that are already supporting marketed products? We get these questions a lot. So Horacio, would you like to comment on this? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a very um, a common question um, in all uh, discussions around this. And uh, the, the idea is, yes, the expectation is that these uh, approaches can support new methods and new products but also can be incorporated into existing monograph when we are able to define the basic element i think it's more or less what, what james did uh, in the british pharmacopoeia so if uh, i would like to ask you if you may can think about it in probably 10 years from now a monograph that in in the addition of containing the description of the analytical procedures procedure containing an ATP for that particular attribute and also contain a description of the um, MODR or what are the, the design space of the method so you can move around uh, parameters, you can uh, identify if the reputable result you have uh, is, is appropriate, is meeting the requirement of the ATP. So basically all the things that we are having today like uh, adjustment of the chromatographic system in 621, uh, verification, transfer, etc., probably will not be needed anymore because the monograph will contain sufficient information to translate the method at any place and, 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 and give you assurance that you are having an appropriate reportable result. So for me, is is a big, big improvement. And I want to add also that something that for me is important is probably one of those first cases where pharmacopoeias uh, were proactively in in creating, uh, in driving an innovation instead of uh, blocking that innovation. And, and we are doing that in, in conjunction with other pharmacopoeia, which is also uh, a very unusual thing. So it's, it's uh, I think that the, 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 um, the consequences of this would be very beneficial for all the stakeholders. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, James, would you like to add to this? Yeah, so um, I, th I think you, know, you made some really interesting points there. So probably the one that jumped out at me was around um, monographs in the future. And I think there, you know, the kind of the analogy with, say, personalized medicine, it's a bit like personalized monograph, where we say rather than and just rely on our kind of generic standards. So in BP and EP, we have chromatographic separation techniques, um, appendix or, or kind of general text. Um, which defines the, the modifications you can make to an analytical method uh, in the pharmacopoeia, so similar to what you described before. And that's a rather generic approach, where actually if we have the information around a QBD approach or method, it can be very specific. Um, and so, for example, in our case study, we found the very specific things related to the chromatography, but also to the sample preparation that could have a significant effect on method performance. Those things where if you would go to the extremities of what you'd be allowed to through uh, something like chromatographic separation techniques, the method would fail. So giving people advanced understanding of where the method sits in terms of a plateau, where the risks sit on it, that optimizing the you know, kind of pharmacopoeial control strategy for the method in the monograph, I think is a really transformational change. Um, so one that I think, I'm, you know, Phil mentioned being excited, I'm really excited to see that because at its heart, public quality standards have to be robust, reliable, and reliable, and that's what people need to assure products, uh, quality of the products that they're testing and releasing. And ultimately, quality underpins the safety and efficacy of medicines going to patients. So I think it's a really, really interesting time, um, potentially, for pharmacopoeias. 
Great, thank you so much, James. Uh, another question that we often get is which specific analytical procedures uh, should analytical quality by design be applied to? Uh, I thought maybe, maybe Phil, you would want to uh, try to answer that question. Yeah, sure, um, Isabel. So I, I think it's a very good question. And um, I, I, I think the tools outlined by the USB, USP and BP um really provide a tool set which can be applied um to any analytical procedure um but 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 i wouldn't recommend um applying them without any thoughts to every analytical procedure um I, I, and i'd really recommend um for you know if, if it's a pharmaceutical company or a generic company to to think through prioritizing uh, amongst their suite of analytical methods, which ones um, are either presenting the most risk at the moment? So where are there currently atypical or out of specification results? Um, you know, where is there known special cause or common cause variability? So, so that's, um, you know, uh, unexpected issues with a method or natural variability associated with a method. Um, and, and, and really start off with the highest priority methods from the most complex ones, perhaps, um, and use the tools which are the most useful to generate that method understanding um, or improve method redevelopment activities. So, so I think we should be judicious with how we apply the tools. Um, and I certainly wouldn't recommend um, spending a, a lot of effort on very simple maybe well-established pharmacopoeial methods where there's you know a, a very large amount of space between uh where the product is running and specification limits if, if there's no risk to the patients if there's no you know real need to uh to fix something then i would then i wouldn't recommend doing anything you know we really should use a risk-based uh logic to decide what we apply these tools to Great, thank you very much. That helps a lot. Um, have a couple of questions about the ICH guidelines. Um, so we, we heard uh, today that the ICH is developing guidelines around product lifecycle management, Q12, that's pretty advanced already, uh, analytical procedure development, Q14, and a revision of Q2 on validation. Um, so Q2 is being implemented, and the question is, how can the concepts in ICH Q12, uh, for instance, established conditions, um, post-approval change, how can that be applied to analytical procedures? Um, I feel, would you like to maybe first be the first one to answer this, and maybe we'll ask if Horacio and James have additional comments. Yeah, I think, I, I think this is a very fluid, area and i know the ich expert working group are working on this at the moment so i, I i'm not sure how much horatio will be able to tell you but um for, from my perspective um I, I think the established conditions will provide a framework um for us to be able to identify what critical elements there are in an analytical procedure so if we follow an aqbd approach we'll be able to designate um which parameters uh, are most important if they're subject to variation. Uh, and going back to what James said, I think that'd be really helpful to end users to uh, understand the method, um, you know, in the pharmacopoeia, rather than running it blind and encountering some of those issues. So I, I think established conditions will offer um, regulatory authorities and method users a lot greater understanding. Um, if we look at another Q12 concept, so that's post-approval change management protocols, um, it's looking like this mechanism could be used with the analytical target profile concept. And the hope here is if we define what we need from what we intend to measure, so for every quality attribute or critical quality attribute, we define an analytical target profile which is essentially the performance characteristics and the criteria 
So how much uncertainty, you know, what's acceptable from a precision and accuracy perspective, that may enable us to define upfront what we need to do if we intend to change the method across the life cycle. And, and the whole idea of post-approval change management protocols or PACMPs is to really agree that upfront between industry and regulators so we um, are more predictive with changes and the hope from an industry perspective is we lower that post-approval change burden by providing science um, and, and really well thought out protocols for what we intend to do if we switch between different technologies, for example, HPLC to UPLC or to online near infrared, you know, can, can we agree with the regulators of how we're going to intend to switch between those technologies? So that's that's my aspiration. And I think things are moving in the right direction, but there's, there's still a way to go to see um, how Q14 will evolve. Wonderful. Yes, I, I, I feel like a lot of our customers uh, are very um, excited about analytical quality by design. But I think the thinking is, will all this work be uh, worth the effort? Is there regulatory, a regulatory benefit down the road? Um, so, uh, James, uh, Horacio, I would like to invite you to comment as well. Uh, James, would you like to go first? So what I would probably say is I would I would I would sit the, the regulatory bit to one side because I think you know that, that's going through its development. What I would say is say from a pharmac appeal perspective, I think what's what's critical and, and what we certainly drew out of some of our work is there needs to be that strong alignment with whatever ultimately comes out of the international guidance through 14 and the revision of two. The pharmac appeals have to align with that. So obviously if those in the history, I think, to go back to Q2's formation, I think that came out of USP's original work around uh, method validation. So, you know, there, there's a strong symbiotic relationship between the pharmacopeers and the regulatory guidance in this area. So what we want to do is uh, maintain alignment. And I think probably what's at the heart of all of this is I understand the uh, desires of um, industry around the, the regulatory parts, but what sits at the heart of all this is improving quality and how that has a direct translational effect on ensuring the safety of patients and making sure they get good quality medicines. So that really should sit at the heart of it. There may be other benefits that can be discussed, but the patient safety really must be at the heart uh, from my perspective. Uh, but I'd be very interested to hear what Horatio thinks as well. I would say not too much to say. You guys say everything. I want to stress that a couple of things. Uh, one of the Phil says is that the fact that the, Q, the value of Q14 is that for the first time we'll provide a unified and harmonized platform for regulators and industry to discuss the validity and the, the capacity of an analytical procedure. So, so with all that information it contained now in an application regarding all the development of the method, people can better understand, regulators and industry better understand how the method works. And that will be, a, a, you know, a very, very critical at the time that post-approval changes and ev the, the continuous evolution of, of, of continued improvement of the methods. Um, from the pharmacopeal point of view, I think that this all this movement will bring the knowledge of the analytical pursuit to a different dimension. So now, with all the uh, uh, all the tools we have at hand to uh, to use uh, analytical quality by design concepts, uh, statistical approaches, technology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will uh, will will give us the knowledge of the method and how the method performs to a, a highest to the highest uh, level of knowledge possible and and you can imagine with with all that massive knowledge at hand you can move in different directions you can improve uh, you can work uh, with the method with a more rational way than we did in the past thank you for those comments for us you um, I'd like to um, move back to the um, uh, chapter 1220 and those concepts that were highlighted in Horacio's presentation. Um, starting with the ATP, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a new concept uh, for a lot of analytical scientists. And Horacio, uh, you provided some guidance on, on what should be in the ATP. Uh, but I think what we would like to see is maybe, um, maybe some examples. Uh, so can you maybe um, share with us some examples of what an ATP look like? Horacio? Um, um, is, thank you, Isabel. Um, I want to add first something that I, I, I will uh, uh, to mention before, is the fact that uh, 1220 and even Q14 have no the intention to change uh, immediately the, the approach the industry uh, is using for meta development. Uh, in the case of USP, our intention is to maintain 1224, 1225, and 1226 approach at the same time that we incorporate 1220 so people can choose one or the other. So there is no intention to make any compulsory uh, change at this point. Uh, that, I think, uh, will answer the question that many people have. Uh, regarding the, what is in the ATP, uh, we did an extensive, uh, bef before, you know, um, uh, choosing a, one uh, uh, um, example or not, we, we did an extensive uh, revision of literature and we find like it, at that point, uh, it was like a, three years ago, uh, 30 or 35 different um, uh, definitions of, of ATP. So uh, we included two um, examples in the chapter um, that are also included in one of the first papers we, uh, we include. And again, the idea is, is a very simple statement that contains the definition of the ATP, what we want to measure, and uh, a description of the matrix. What should what would be in that matrix? So we will uh, we will um, want to um, measure A in the presence of X, Y, and Z. Uh, what is the range of the measurement? For example, if this is a drug product, when usually the limits are 90, 110 we probably want to extend this measurement to 75 or 70, 115 to be used for continuous, uh, for uh, continuous uniformity, for example. And, uh, and, and I think that the, and the more important part is the uh, quality of the, of the reportable value. How we will define this is the, where the difference are. More traditional ways would be to establish one accuracy uh, um, and, and one precision for the measurement. Others want to go to the concept of total analytical error, which is uh, the, the uh, measuring uh, accuracy and precision as a one parameter. Uh, there is an example in USP in, in chapter 12, uh, 1210. Um, or you can go to the uncertainty concept, where you will define what is the uncertain, the maximum uh, expanded uncertainty you expect in your measurement. That That is probably, the more critical part and probably the more uh, challenging because we as a analytical chemist sometimes are, we are not familiar with this concept. So we need to, and I will insist with this, I, I was trying to do it for the last five years, we need to sit together uh, statisticians, analytical chemists and metrologists and came out with something that, uh, I mean, uh, I would say a common jargon that everybody can understand and use because I think it, this is what probably one of the barriers we have today. Thank you very much, Horacio. Um, uh, James, is there anything you would like to add? Is the, uh, I guess, the uh, definition of ATP uh, any different uh, on the other side of the pond? So, I mean, what we did is we explored a number of different ATPs because I think as Horacio said, there's there's different ways you could define the components of an ATP. So in the, um, it, what uh, went out with our consultation was a technical document. This is about a 30 page long document that talks through the analytical parts and uh, the kind of justification for the approaches we adopted during this project, looking at Torvastat and tablets. And in terms of the ATP, we looked at one which kept accuracy and precision independent. Another one, which is similar to what Horatio described around the combined measurement uncertainty, so taking the precision and accuracy together. Another one related to the use of, I think, a Horwitz function. Um, so that's just a function relating to precision related to the concentration of the analyte in question, and we developed some criteria for that. 
And then the other one used, and I think I mentioned it earlier, is a criteria called the test uncertainty ratio, which is really the ratio between the width of the specification and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uncertainty associated with the measurement. So the expanded uncertainty. So we took a number of different ones. And the reason we did that is we, we kind of wanted to run them through the machine and see what kind of results we got and what were the potential benefits and disadvantages. And I think there's there's different advantages to different types of ATP. So it'll be interesting as things emerge from ICH, uh, how we will go about defining um, ATPs. Um, and I think, you know, that the benefits that we saw in it certainly were that, that predefining bit that Horatio touched on at the beginning around upfront deciding what we want our methods to achieve. You know, perhaps in the past that hasn't always been defined in quite such a specific way. So I think that has a lot of value. Um, and certainly for the farm compare value in terms of how you would compare other methods potentially to it. So comparing perhaps your in-house method to the compendial method and um, in, whether you want to use one or the other uh, in your testing. Thank you very much, James. Um, Heather, you've been quiet. <laughs> I have a question no, for you, Heather. You. <laughs> Um, so, as I was reading uh, USP chapter 1220, I noticed that it includes uh, an Ishikawa diagram and a heat map with analytical LC variables uh, to look at uh, risk factors that impact data accuracy and precision. So, Heather, the question I have for you is you, know, you have um, experience, uh, and I wanted to ask you what would you say are the, maybe the typical risk factors? Um, in LC method development that could potentially impact data quality. What do you, you know, what have you observed? What do you hear from, from customers? Um, thanks, Isabel. Um, now, I've looked at, through the 1220 examples and looking at those risk areas and, and say my focus really, as well as look, making sure that the system suitability and robustness is going to pass, I'm really looking at that resolution aspect, which I think is causing a lot of, lot of concerns. Um, I think the heat map that's in the 1230 chapter and, and the fish diagram are really good at, at making a start on it. And I think, but I think it's an example. I, I'm a little concerned that people might look at something like that heat, heat map and go, okay, so now I know what this, for my, I just picked this one as a high, this one's green, we don't have to change that. And I think it's depend, very method dependent. Um, on what factors are going to be critical risk factors in there. Um, pH is one that we know can have a giant effect on selectivity at peaks uh, for certain methods that are very sensitive to that pH. And so making sure that we can have a control around pH is going to be often uh, really critical to ensure that peaks stay in the same place in the chromatogram where they really need to be. But I, th I think it is a good exercise. Uh, it's a good example to get people really thinking about what are the risks to my method. And they may be things that, you know, we, I'm hoping that during that phase one, people will uncover things that typically just picking a method that they found on the internet or, or a compendial method and just running it, they won't understand what those critical factors are. So I think it's really important. But I would say that p pH and temperature for me, as well as percent organic, are really key ones that we know can move those peaks around so much and end up with them not, not separated from each other. Um, I'm going to um, switch gears and and ask you about uh, robustness and MODR. I think we 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 all agree that there is a desire to develop robust analytical methods. Uh, in in 1220 and in Q14, uh, there is a mention of the method operable design region or MODR, and that's a new concept for many LC method developers. Um, so I guess if I could ask uh, maybe one of you to tell us what the MODR is and, and why we should consider having an MODR. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Horacio, would you like to tell us about the uh, MODR? Maybe you can start. It was in your presentation, so I can click on you. <laughs> Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I think when um, we adopted uh, all these concepts from from ITAQ9, QA, and um, the uh, the idea of MODR is the equivalent of the design space in 
in uh, QVD, in the classical QVD. So when we transport that into analytical QVD, the term we use is, is um, metal operable design region. And, and again, is a, is a very important concept because what you are trying to define is in which uh, uh, space the method can be modified without changing the, um, the uh, performance of the method. You're still having results that are meeting the ATP. However, you made uh, adjustments to the method according to, the, to your need. The ultimate goal is that can we uh, switch technologies based on MODR and ATP? Um, I, I don't know if we are close to that, but is is the ultimate idea. But at this point, I think it's a is a is a more uh, continuous uh, development of the robustness study. Uh, instead of having point estimates, now we have a surface that will identify how the method operate in the different regions. Um, I, that is the expectation. I think that we can move in this direction because again, now we have the technology that allow us to do it. Um, and uh, and I, I hope that the companies will start using it. And I'm assuming that uh, some of the former companies are already using it and testing. I, th I think that there are still a lot of questions on how MODR can be developed. Um, and I hope that as we move into this direction, more and more people will start using it and start providing more answers. Thank you, Horacio. Uh, James, is there anything you would like to add to Horacio's comments? So I agree with what Horacio said. I think what was interesting in the study that we conducted is it was thinking of, you know, so the memo is this kind of multivariate space in which we've got all the changes to our method, you know, whether there's changes to percentage organic in the mobile phase or pH or whatever. And we're understanding the effects of those and using DOEs, for example, can be useful to explore that. But it's what was the utility in a pharmacopoeia concept? So it's one, is it actually just a very enhanced form of robustness to say, look, I can look at the space and know where my method could be moving around and it's going to be stable versus select you know proactively wanting to move my method and the question in debate we had was well for a farm appeal method why would you want to do that so if there was a problem with meeting your control strategy or system suitability then there's some logic and understanding if you could make a change and it would the method wasn't going to fall off a cliff but making kind of changes for the sake of it within an MODR we didn't see a particular benefit to it. so I think understanding the utility of MODR for methods being the pharmacopoeia or others going forward, other than that robustness piece, I think it's worthwhile understanding as we go forward. And I think that's a, that's a bit of a discovery that we will go through, hopefully. Thank you. Um, thank you, James. Um, Phil, um, you know, perspective from the industry, would you like to comment on the MODR, please? Yeah, I, I mean, if we think about the method operable design re region, um, again, from a GSK perspective, we, we, we don't see um, much value in registering a method operable design region. Um, we see the value more in developing um, the enhanced robustness, doing modeling experiments to demonstrate that where we intend to operate the analytical procedure is robust. Um, and if you've done that, um, we don't see any reason why you would want to to change the method conditions. Now, there might be the occasional method where one parameter is subject to variability, um, and you may want flexibility in that method parameter. But I would ask, um, maybe you've got a non-robust method. So... I, I, I'm not entirely sure from a regulatory perspective why we would need an MOTR, but I think the benefit is really in exploring the MOTR to basically justify that the set points where you intend to operate the method is robust. Uh, okay, so we're getting close to the end time. Um, I do have a question about, um, you know, getting started, uh, implementation of those approaches. Um, so maybe a question for James. It seems that adopting this enhanced approach will require you know, new skills and capabilities. 
Um, how can an analytical scientist build the skill set needed to be successful with analytical quality by design? And then maybe a side question is, you know, beside the analytical scientists, what are standard, st standard setting agencies and regulatory bodies um, doing to also uh, expand their skill set and build capabilities? So that's a great question, actually. Um, it's a kind of a million dollar question, I think. Um, how does everyone prepare themselves for the future? And I think, if, if, I, if I think broadly, actually, I don't think this challenge around making sure we've got the right skill sets is unique to the world of analytics. I think the pace of change in life sciences, med tech is accelerating. So I think everyone's having to consider the types of skills we need in the future. So whether that's um, statistics that we've talked about a lot, and I think Herazio made a great point around building capabilities, um, you know, data scientists, there's, there's a huge number of different new skills, I think, that we're going to need to make a success of this. And I think the other point that comes into it is it's where cross-functional teams come together. So what we did when we convened our project was we brought together folks who were assessing licenses, folks who were going out and inspecting organizations. So they're seeing the change control part and in operation. Um, we brought in statisticians from the agency. As Horatio said, when it comes to forming the expert panels, bring in folks from metrology areas um, to understand the training they've got. Now, if you think about ISO um, and other organizations like that who've defined a lot of work around measurement uncertainty, they have publications, they have training courses. So to some degree, it's about being proactive and identifying those different opportunities. I mean, USP, I think, have done great work to go out and try and educate folks uh, in these areas. So I think the system is trying to work to support uh, users uh, to develop their skills. But as you said, it's a mirror, so it reflects back into our organization. So when we initiated our project in MHRA in the BP, one of the key aims of it was to build our own capability. You know, these concepts were being talked about in industry and we're going back a few years now when we initiated it. There's a recognition we had to increase our skills and capability in this area to enable us to have effective conversations with industry. And actually, I think that's where the pharmacopeers can play a really unique role. So you have the regulators, you have industry. Pharmacopeers are somewhere in between because they work, the function of the pharmacopeia works by having industry in the room as we develop together standards for medicines. So it's an opportunity to have some conversations there where it isn't relating to marketing authorization. So I think it's really great the work that the USP and BP and others have been involved with, because I think that's the space where some of this, these discussions and around what kind of training skills capability do we need can um, actually occur. Thank you so much, James. Um, Phil, welcome back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, would you like to come on developing skills and uh, building capabilities, um, you know, from your point of view in the industry? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is something I've been involved in in the last 10 years within GSK. So I, so I think the key is, is really in training, um, in developing the framework, um, in creating roles through method design, through method understanding, through, you know, uh, generating the MODR, if we think that's a useful concept, onward into life cycle through to, um, you know, assessing method performance on an ongoing basis. And, and I think critical to the success is identifying the method owners all the way through from early development into late phase development into commercial manufacture um, and really working with those method owners with subject matter experts. So we may have risk facilitators, we may have expert modelers working with statisticians to, to apply DOE type concepts. We may have a central group who helps teams um, apply the analytical target profile. So we really need to think about the roles we need to put in place, a small group of subject matter experts who can be there on tap um, to really help and aid the people who are owning the method at different parts of the life cycle. And those method owners are going to change. So we need to be quite careful to make sure that we transfer the knowledge and make sure those new method owners at each part of the process are well supported. So I think it's an excellent question. Um, and it's something we, we found challenging, but you know we're getting there with the right support. Thank you very much. It's very, very helpful. Um, we are uh, running out of time. So before we wrap up, I would like to ask each of the panelists uh, to maybe share some parting words 
Um, um, maybe I can still, you were, you were just on. Um, anything you would like to share with, with our listeners uh, as we conclude? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I hope um, listeners have found this helpful. Um, we're sort of reaching quite an exciting junction. Um, you know, towards the end of this year, maybe going into early next year, we're going to get the first versions of ICHQ14 and ICHQ2. Um, so I'd recommend people to to wait for those, get involved. Um, if you haven't already had the opportunity through some of the industry trade associations um, and really provide comments, you know, um, the ICH process is an open public consultation. Um, and, and really, you know, today through a lot of the great work that Pharma Peers have done, you know, we, we really try to provide a lot of input into that discussion. Um, but, but my recommendation is if you're interested, get involved, um, and respond directly to the ICH if you, if you feel passionate about this. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Heather, would you like to go next? Now, I think this is a, a, such a great initiative, and we've been watching it very closely at Waters for the, for the last maybe 20 years, I suppose, since we brought the UPLC out in that first time, and there was an opportunity to really improve analytical methods, and there were seem to be a lot of barriers to make those improvements. So I'm really encouraged that, that we've got that situation now, that we can explore improving methods, and I'm really, my words to the audience will be, you know, grab this opportunity, have the courage, to use this as a really good reason to go back over analytical methods, as Phil said, particularly the ones that are troublesome for you, to get a really good idea of how you can make an improved method and how you can assess and document the robustness of it. We really encourage that. Thank you. That is great, Heather. Uh, uh, James? I'd, I'd like to echo what Phil and Heather has said, I think it's a genuinely exciting time. I think we are coming out to where there will be changes. And sometimes I guess I'm of an age now where I can recall when some of these discussions uh, or these projects first started. Um, I was a little bit younger then. Um, so it's nice to see it starting to come to reality. And it is driven by uh, all the right and good intentions. And the other thing I think, if I reflect on everything, is I think it's been great, the collaboration. So whether it's been collaboration with regulators, standard setting bodies and industry or between the pharmacopeers. peers. So the great dialogue we've had with, with USP over the last few years to share thoughts and ideas. So I think that's uh, been great. Um, and I think just to echo Phil's point, you know, there is an opportunity to get involved of the work of the we're doing. And I'm sure with USP, um, we have our consultation response uh, published and there is a you know, clear indication there that we're open to involvement of other uh, folks. So if you are interested, you know, please do get in contact. Um, I'm sure there's ways that we can involve others. So it's, yeah, it's a, a bright, exciting future, I think. Wonderful. Thank you, James. And Horacio? And again, nothing too much uh, different to say. Um, the I, I'm so excited to see how, in, how much interest this is developing. Uh, events like this are happening more and more often, so that's a good signal. Um, and it's a good signal because as, as we discuss more, as we learn more, we can improve. And, and, and that, I think, is the, the idea. Uh, stressing what uh, uh, Phil and, and James says, uh, 1220 is open for comments uh, since uh, the beginning of uh, September to the end of November. And, and it, will, it will be very important for users familiar with this or unfamiliar with this approach, send your comments, positive or negative, uh, to help us to improve the document. Thank you, Horacio. It has been absolutely wonderful to hear all of your insights on a topic of such great importance for patient safety. Uh, for me, it is clear from this conversation that protecting the patient is at the center of all these efforts. And it's impressive to see the engagement and the collaboration of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the pharmacopoeia, standard setting agencies, uh, regulatory bodies and also instrument manufacturers uh, towards uh, the goal of patient safety. So thank you to all of you for your great work 
and for taking the time to sharing your insights uh, with us. And um, with this, uh, I will let um, Sarah close the, the webinar. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for our presenters and panel for today's informative discussion. And thank you for everyone joining us online. If we didn't have time to answer your questions, we'll follow up with these after today's event. And if you do have any other questions, please feel free to submit them now using the submit a question button to the left of your screen. Or you can email me at editor at selectscience.net and I will follow up with your questions for our presenters. Remember, you can also download a certificate of attendance in the related resources tab to the left of your screen. And if you'd like to listen to today's webinar again or to invite a colleague to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in a few days time. So goodbye and thank you once again for joining us.